Drone footage shows groups of migrants from Central America making their way north throughout Mexico toward the U.S. border. The caravan is passing through the state of Oaxaca on its way now to Mexico City. Organizers say they'll meet with other migrants willing to join them in cities along the way. Migrants have clashed with the Mexican National Guard along the trip. This group says they're heading for the northern Mexican state of Sonora, which borders Arizona. Para su seguridad, hemos venido desde Chiapas y ninguna, ningún lado hemos bloqueado la carretera porque ustedes la bloquean. Para su seguridad. A ver, pero en Chiapas no lo hicieron porque ustedes sí. Esa, esa ampolla ya no aguanta, es lo caliente de, de la, del pavimento. De tanto que hemos caminado, hemos decidido eh, entregarnos al grupo de ETA. Porque no han enseñado evidencia que sí, es cierto, pues, que están dando la visa. Y confiamos en Dios que sí, que lo den, porque habemos muchas personas que no aguantamos caminar. Demasiado camino, ya no muy cansado, demasiado, se sienten los pies muy, muy pesados, sin ni modo, ya que salió esta oportunidad, pues verdad que el grupo Beta los está, usted los está dando la tarjeta. Nosotros decidimos entregarnos, pues nos trajeron aquí, como pueden ver, a migración y pues creemos en la forma que vamos por los momentos, que es cierto, porque... No están encerrando a nadie, no le están quitando la pertenencia a nadie. Tú puedes andar tu teléfono, no te juzgan, nada. No más te toman las fotos, tu formación. Y pues ahorita estamos que no más a transferir ya a lo que es el centro del país de México. Ya allá la estabilización es donde nos van a dar la tarjeta. Y ya de ahí pues cada quien ya decide para dónde agarrar. Well, as Fox News' uh, Bill Malusion reported earlier in our hour, Border Patrol agents this week arrested four members of the savage MS-13 gang, along with two migrants with previous arrest records for alleged sex crimes trying to cross the southern border. This is President Biden is now set to meet next Thursday with Mexican President Obrador on these issues. Right in the middle of all this is Rio Grande City, where the mayor, Joel Villarreal, joins us now. Uh, Mr. Mayor, good to see you. The, the president will meet good with. Good afternoon. The, good afternoon. The president will meet with uh, his uh, Mexican counterpart. What do you think the president should say? And can do you think they achieve anything concrete to help you? First of all, good afternoon. And on behalf of the great city of Rio Grande City, thank you for having me on your show. Um, go, these level of apprehensions, the Rio Grande Valley, for decades, we have endured these level of apprehensions. And we're talking about MS-13 gang members, uh, cartel operatives, individuals with ties to terror organizations. And that's independent of which political party has been in power. So at this point, it must be a bi binational solution. And absolutely, we need to meet with Mexico and address these issues at, at, their, at uh, their southern border. Can't even speak anymore. But... Uh, I'll kidding aside, but yes, these are issues that must be addressed with a binational solution, just like we need to have a bipartisan solution here in the U.S. with all our national leaders doing the same thing. Because these issues continue to arise, and we've had these com this conversation before, and if we don't do address it 10 years from today, we'll be having the same conversation. So again, now, kudos to our law enforcement entities, local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies that all work together and collaborate to safeguard the public and secure the border. And they are doing a tremendous job. However, that we need are. our national leaders to, to address this with bipartisan, binational solutions that will 
um, have conceivable consequences uh, and longevity with these type of results and solutions. We're looking now at video uh, of a group uh, shot Wednesday in Mexico. We hear there's another caravan coming, 10,000 or so. What would you tell Mexican authorities to try and stop this? What concrete measures do you think and would you call on officials to take now to try and get a handle on this? Let's start off with the southern border, Mexico's southern border. These are This is something that the U.S. can provide resources as well as intelligence to address this at, at, that, at that level before they come through, the, through Mexico and come to our southern border. Uh, definitely, plus, keep in mind that we need to address the issues that lead Central Americans to, to uh, leave their home countries. What are some of those issues? I know they've been addressed before, but have we really done or, or, or solidified any concrete solutions to this? And I don't think we have. In fact, going back to immigration reform, we have not addressed this in decades. And I know I've said this in your show, and I'm sure people are tired of me saying this, but uh, it's the same concept. We have not prioritized immigration reform and haven't had the political will to address it. So are we going to do this today? So not just having this conversation. It's great to go meet, and I hope this is not a a uh, conversation where they're just going to be taking a few photographs um, and then not really deal with these concrete solutions. But absolutely, it must be done. And some of these, of course, is addressing it, as I mentioned earlier, at the southern border. And uh, now in some cases, too, are they going to allow these individuals to have work visas in Mexico uh, as well? Um, and some of these individuals want to work. And, of course, that's part of the process of pursuing this American dream. But also some of these uh, Central Americans uh, live in Mexico as well. They spend their time in Mexico um, and not just the U.S. So this is a binational issue that we need to address. And, and hopefully we have the political will to address it. And very soon, because if not, we will have these conversations for 10, 15, mm -hmm. 20 years from today. And finally, quickly, uh, Mayor, how does this affect your community? Our community, we continually coordinate, by the way, with, with uh, local law enforcement entities, federal law enforcement entities, to make sure that we are prepared. And honestly, we don't have the resources to, to uh, especially when it comes to medical necessities, uh, we don't have them, especially we're going to have 10, 15, 14,000 people at our front door. We're not going to have, we wouldn't be equipped to address that, that level of, of influx of migrants. Uh, but we continually work with our federal partners collaboratively. And uh, again, I cannot say enough about our law enforcement entities, both local, state and federal, should I say all three, yeah. uh, because they do a tremendous job and day in, day out, in spite of what happens around them. Because keep in mind, we've had, and I say this before, and, and I cannot say this enough, independent of which political party has been in power, this has been an issue. And are we going to address it as a country? We have failed to address it. And hopefully we are in the very near future addressing these matters because, yes, our communities are affected, whether it's uh, having to provide medical resources or having to provide law enforcement, uh, in the law enforcement entities or, or officers to address or help out with some of these, these uh, potential risk factors that come into play when it comes to having some the criminal element now not everyone is criminal of course mm -hmm. i mean we know that for a fact some of them come this way too that are not in any point uh coming to this country to to yep. um for any type of crime or whatnot but but you nonetheless do, we need to address it you do feel it you're on the front line you feel it first uh you have a wonderful community uh and a very important yes, we message do. uh mayor uh yes jo we do joel villarreal we thank you and we'll keep on having you on to spread the message because you are affected first. Thank you, Mayor. Thank Arthel? you. Appreciate your time. These people here are truly victims. They're promised the American dream at a high price, and it's not delivered, as you can see. The one man was injured. Nobody cared about that. He cares about getting his money and moving on. Good evening. Thank you for choosing KTAB News. I'm Bob Bartlett. And I'm Joni McKinnon. A human trafficker is apprehended on Interstate 20 in Thai, and 15 victims who were crammed into the back of a minivan have been taken to jail. This just 24 hours after the Texas-Mexico border reopened. KTAB's Marley Capper was at the scene in Thai and joins us here live in the studio now. Marley, walk us through what you saw just a couple of hours ago. 
Well, Bob and Joni, it was anything like I've seen before. I've been covering the immigration crisis in the big country for a while. This is the first time I've been able to make eye contact with the humans who have been trafficked and smuggled. I mean, you could really see the emotion in their eyes. They looked tired. They looked thirsty. Some of them were even tearing up. Thai Police Chief Jay Strong was training a new officer on the highway when they performed a routine license plate scan. The license was from Arizona, but unregistered to any vehicle. That's when Strong pulled over the car. He asked the, via- the driver to remove his keys. He saw 15 people in the back, and they asked him to step out of the car. 13 males and two female victims were present. The driver had cocaine and drug paraphernalia on his person, including a large amount of cash. Identified they're out of Guatemala, uh, according to one of the victims, and that's what they are as victims. They have been traveling for four to five days across the desert out of Arizona. So... That's what we know at this time. Border Patrol is going to take them and book them on immigration holds. One male victim did receive medical attention for a swollen ankle. The man telling Chief Strong he was walking the desert for four days and injured himself. Chief Strong says they do anticipate more traffic stops on the highway since the border has recently reopened. In the last three months, Thai PD has apprehended over 70 victims of human smuggling. Strong did tell me, like I said, he expects to see more apprehensions like this. All right, thank you, Molly. So what exactly happened to that driver or even the victims? Well, the 15 victims were transported, and they're going to go ahead and be processed. The driver, however, is expected to be tried for 15 counts of human smuggling, as well as the narcotics found on him. It did take some time and several vehicles. I mean, this is 15 people. They're having to separate the driver from the victims to make sure they're not being intimidated. And then, of course, picking up and dropping off all 15 people, but they all are in custody. Well, Marley, did they find anything else in the car while they searched? Well, Bob, in my previous reporting, I have done an in-depth story on what Thai PD looks for in their procedures. Their actions were true to their word. They searched the vehicle and found man-made compartments. So these are things that aren't made from the car manufacturer, which is a telltale sign to Thai PD. This vehicle has been used to hide and smuggle drugs before. They did not find more narcotics than was on the driver. However, the search was extensive. And as always, I will continue my investigation into the immigration crisis across the big country. Chief Strong expects more of this in the upcoming days. Live in studio, Marley Capper, KTAP News. All right, excellent reporting. Thank you, Marley. Chief Strong says the extra dark tent on the car windows was recently put on, a tactic smugglers use to hide the number of people in the vehicle. Chief Strong also saying that the best thing residents can do if you happen to see something like this, say something. If you would like to watch any of Marley's investigative reporting, you can certainly find that on our website, bigcountryhomepage.com. Another in a series of heartbreaking stories from the southern border. Our Fox team there ran into a five-year-old wandering the Rio Grande Valley by himself. Agents tell us the boy's parents are already in the U.S. and that encounters with unaccompanied minors at the border this year are higher than any other time on record. Bill Malusian back on the story for us in La Jolla, Texas. Bill, good morning. Trace, good morning to you. Already a lot of activity out here in La Jolla this morning. Real quick, want to show you this bus which is pulling out right now. That is full of unaccompanied children and young teenagers. We just watched them all being marched onto that bus. It's all little kids all young teenagers, all completely by themselves. No parents, no guardians. This is a big group that crossed here this morning. Sanford, if we can pan back over here, there were more than 100 migrants who just crossed here in La Jolla. You can see some of them are still waiting to be apprehended over here. These are mostly those family units, the ones you see under the tarp right there. Those are the complete family units, moms, dads with their kids. But the bus that's leaving is completely alone, unaccompanied minors. Take a look at this video we shot here this morning from our Fox drone as these groups were starting to arrive this morning. We see this every day out here in La Jolla. They cross over the Rio Grande, they walk down this road, and then they voluntarily give themselves up to Border Patrol here in hopes that they will be released into the country. All those children that were leaving on the bus, they will go over into HHS custody. But you mentioned that little boy off the top. Take a look at this video we shot right here, same spot, Saturday night. Pretty heart-wrenching to look at. A five-year-old Guatemalan boy traveling completely by himself showed up here. We kept our shots pretty tight to respect his privacy, but agents told us that little boy's parents are already here in the United States. But believe it or not, 
a, a, a little boy that young, this sort of thing happens all the time during this border crisis. Take a look at this graphic right here. Shocking numbers. Just in fiscal year 2021 alone, there were about 147,000 unaccompanied children or unaccompanied minors who showed up here at the border. You take a look at the 2020 numbers, uh, it's almost a five-fold increase. So it's happening constantly down here. Take a look at this video we shot Saturday night. That boy was part of this massive group that showed up right where we're standing here in La Jolla. Upwards of 300 people showing up here at this park. Again, all family units all looking to turn themselves in, and we see it all the time. Little kids traveling completely alone in those big groups. Now, it's not just here in La Jolla where the activity is. Take a look at this video, photos out of Kinney County in the Del Rio area. That's where Texas DPS caught these 25 single adult male runners who are trying to get away. This is inland from the border. They've already crossed. You can see these guys are all in camouflage or in black. They do not want to be caught. They are not turning themselves in. You're going to see a close up of one guy. This is an aggravated felon who had an ice warrant out for his arrest for, ag for re entry. Uh, he spent seven years in prison here in Texas for aggravated robbery. So these are some of the guys mixed into those runners who do come across the border. 20 runners got away that night. Now back out here live, that's the big story, the gotaways. We see the family units turning themselves in all the time. We see the runners. What we don't always see are the gotaways. Just in one 24-hour period here in Rio Grande Valley over the weekend, a DHS source tells us there were 262 known gotaways. Those are people they see on the cameras, they see on the sensors, they're just not able to get to. The big question is, how many unknown gotaways are there? But 262, one day, one sector. Um, it's pretty remarkable, Trace. We'll send it back to you. The high thousands. Bill Belugian down at the border for us. Bill, thank you. El Paso sector of the Border Patrol has encountered a record number of unaccompanied children, 23,000 in fiscal year 2021. But that number may not be accurate given the fact that the El Paso sector has encountered a record number of adults posing as unaccompanied children. ABC7 Cell Science joins us live in the newsroom with the details. And so why would migrant adults try to pose as unaccompanied children? Well, Eric, I've been talking to my sources, and my sources tell me the reason for the attempted switch is because migrant children have a better chance at staying in the U.S. as opposed to adults. And according to Border Patrol officials, the number of migrant adults posing as unaccompanied children is substantial. We're learning from Border Patrol agents the number of migrant adults posing as unaccompanied children in fiscal year 2021 was a whopping 559 migrants. And going into fiscal year 2022, as of October 1st, agents encountered 55 adults posing as migrant children. Border Patrol officials say transnational criminal organizations are recruiting and convincing migrants to pose as unaccompanied children. Border Patrol officials say agents at the Centralized Processing Center are catching migrants trying to pose as children after interviewing them. Unaccompanied migrant children have a better opportunity of staying in the U.S. due to policy set forth by the Office of Refugee Resettlement Program. Now, Border Patrol officials say migrants trying to pose as unaccompanied children can face charges when trying to illegally enter the U.S. by line, penalties such as five years in prison. Stephanie? New details out today on the efforts of Operation Lone Star to add fencing along the Texas-Mexico border. The head of the Texas National Guard tweeted out pictures showing the Guard setting up temporary fencing topped with razor wire, shipping containers, and guard vehicles along the banks of the Rio Grande. The Texas Military Department tells us they have completed four miles of fencing between Del Rio and Brownsville, but they added crews already cleared and graded more miles in Valverde and Maverick counties. Governor Greg Abbott's campaign sent out the message saying progress is being made on the border wall. Texas is securing the border and it will repel people crossing illegally into Texas. All of this as one Central American migrant caravan dwindles in Mexico and another is trying to form. Our colleagues at Border Report say an activist is trying to form a caravan of 10,000 people near Veracruz. The goal is for the caravan to be ready a week from now when President Biden is set to meet with his Mexican and Canadian counterparts. Texas has surged 2,500 National Guardsmen to our southern border as part of Operation Lone Star. They're coordinating with law enforcement officials to mitigate the record level of migrant crossings this year. But as KXAN's Maggie Glenn reports, we've received several complaints from Guardsmen having difficulties with exemptions and benefits. Guardsman Dustin Ryan says when he was called up to head to the border, his medical exemption after recent ankle surgery was declined. They were trying to send me no matter what, even though my surgeon said that I couldn't, you know, carry any of the extra weight, couldn't 
stand for a long period of time. When he got to training, he was released after failing his medical exam. I shouldn't have ever gotten to that point. The guard points out this is part of their usual process, and they evaluate exemptions on a case-by-case -case basis. The governor says these guardsmen are needed right now as the state prepares for another migrant caravan. We continue to surge personnel, equipment, and capabilities into the region from Del Rio to Brownsville. This fall, the legislature approved $300 million to surge more guardsmen to the border. Meanwhile, the governor required all state departments to cut their budgets by 5%. So the Texas military department slashed its tuition assistance program by more than half, down to $1.4 million. That's only enough to help about 700 of the 20,000 guardsmen. Directing them to the border and then taking valuable benefits that they rely on for their own education, uh, to better their lives and to better their families' lives, is just completely unacceptable. And the length of the operation, which launched back in March, is also weighing on guardsmen. We'd respond to a hurricane uh, disaster or tornadoes. You'd be gone a week, two, maybe three at the most. Uh, most of us can handle that. What we signed up for was, you know, maybe a month's worth of work, not a year's worth of work. Maggie Glenn, KXAN News. There is no clear timeline of when Operation Lone Star could end. Uh, meanwhile, more backlash over President Biden's immigration policies as yet another migrant caravan heading toward the United States. Our next guest just visited the border and is sounding the alarm on what he's calling a secret and very organized operation to bring more and more illegal migrants into the United States. Texas Congressman Lance Gooden joins us right now from Dallas. Congressman, good morning to you. Good morning. How are things? Uh, they're okay, but I think people are going to be shocked to hear uh, you've been in contact with a whistleblower who has shown your office documents from a nonprofit that essentially are a roadmap for the migrants on how to get anywhere in the country. That's right. This whistleblower reached out to us from San Diego. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing, and so I uh, planned a trip. I went last week to San Diego to the southern border, and what I found were nonprofits that were running secretive, closed-down hotels, the Four Points Sheraton, SeaWorld, a Wyndham, a Ramada Inn. Those were just three of the ones that I visited. But these non-government uh, organizations, that, these nonprofits were housing migrants for several days. I managed to get in the gates. I demanded entry once and was refused. I talked a guard into letting me in on another occasion. And when I was in there, I saw buses pulling up, probably about 100 migrants over an hour got off of these buses. They were processed. Um, they were welcomed by people with open arms right. that were there in the facility, uh, co tested for COVID, and then they were given packets. And this packet is what I received from the whistleblower a few weeks ago. And these packets detail how to go to the airport, how to get past TSA without any identification, how to enroll your children in schools and assimilate in whatever community you desire to go in. Right. And it's encouraging uh, illegal immigration. And uh, furthermore, we went to the airport and talked with some of the TSA people who said, yeah, we, we get these migrants here. They have these very convincing letters. And in some cases, they're being led onto planes before anyone else. And in uh, wow. one case, a security officer on the plane uh, said, you know, I'm uh, an armed agent. I'm supposed to identify myself to the pilot before takeoff. I'm sometimes getting on these flights and immigrants with no identification are on the plane before uh, the agent board. So in a case of having a, it's unbelievable, and I, I could go on and on, so I'll, I'll let you talk, but in, right. in some cases. You, go, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm curious, what nonprofit is, is putting these packets out? Well, there are several, uh, but the biggest defenders in San Diego are the Catholic Charities and the Jewish Family Association. And, you know, it's difficult because someone like myself, if I go criticizing uh, those two organizations, I'm either mm -hmm. anti-Catholic or anti-Semitic. Uh, but in these cases, they are uh, taking in money from private individuals. They're taking in money from corporations. AT&T, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Financial Advisors, those are just a few of the companies right. uh, nationwide that are contributing to these groups. And sure. they're working with the state of California. And plus, the federal government is giving these nonprofits money to facilitate getting them into the United States. We, we know that. Uh, I guess the big question is, while, while the details, when you see them, are eye-opening, are they breaking any laws? 
Well, I mean, I, I think they probably could be. The first law is entering the nation illegally. Uh, but go back to that airport scenario I gave you. Imagine no identification. Right. What if there is a terrorist among them? That terrorist is then sitting on the plane and knows who the armed federal agent is that has uh, visited with the pilot and says, hey, I'm on board and I'm armed. Uh, there are so many opportunities for disaster with this policy. Uh, but one of the, the big disasters is the encouragement that's being sent across the world to come to our southern border border, especially California, and enter this nation, and you can go anywhere you want to. And we have no record of who's coming and where they're going. It's a disgrace. Lance Gooden uh, join us today from Dallas. Congressman, thank you. For members of the MS-13 gang and two other migrants previously jailed for sexual crimes were apprehended by Rio Grande Valley Border Patrol Sector, RGV, agents. The four migrants were actively involved in the MS-13 street gang. According to a press release from U.S. Customs and Border Protection, two had previously been deported. MS-13, or Mara Salvatruca, is an international criminal gang from the 1970s and 1980s in Los Angeles, California. Initially, the group was formed to protect Salvadoran immigrants in the Los Angeles area from other gangs. The gang evolved into a more typical criminal organization over time. MS-13 is known for its brutality and rivalry with the 18th Street Gang. They are currently active in the continental United States, Canada, Mexico, and Central America. Most members are Central American, Salvadorans in particular. On November 9, one individual was apprehended by Brownsville Border Patrol Station officials after he unlawfully entered the United States near McAllen, Texas. Records checks at the station indicated that the 37-year-old Guatemalan national had been convicted of lewd, lascivious behavior with a child under 16. The defendant received a sentence of more than 21 months in prison. On November 12, a group of six migrants was apprehended near Roma by Rio Grande City Border Patrol officials. According to records, one of the subjects has an active warrant for his arrest for lascivious battery out of Orange County, Florida. The arrests come as the federal government attempts to protect the border amid a surge in illegal crossings. According to New York Post, Texas Governor Greg Abbott has criticized the Biden administration for the influx of migrants entering his state. As a result, Abbott announced that he had sent National Guard troops and the State Department of Public Safety to the border to stop migrant caravans from entering the country. DPS said in a statement, at the direction of Governor Greg Abbott, the Texas Department of Public Safety, DPS, and the Texas Military Department is committed to securing the Texas border. As part of Operation Lone Star, OLS, Texas DPS continues to enforce all state violations of law including, but not limited to, criminal trespass, criminal mischief, smuggling, and human trafficking. Laredo Sector Border Patrol agents and Webb County constables say they have arrested a man believed to be a member of the Mexican drug cartel near the U.S. border. This is down in Texas. Jose Francisco Paz Ruiz was arrested in Laredo, Texas. Officials say he had outstanding warrants with both Webb County and the Texas DPS. They say he's believed to be a member of Cartel del Noreste. Officers say when they tried to arrest Ruiz, he got into a truck with another person and the two ran. Both jumped out under a bridge over the Rio Grande and tried to swim to Mexico. The driver made it to the other side, but Ruiz was taken into custody. Arresting documents indicate a possible motive for the quarry shooting where 27-year-old Alana Castaneda suffered a gunshot to the face. The man charged with shooting her. Julio Cesar Rivera is also charged with aggravating robbery in a carjacking just last month. Rivera told police he was stealing the car for human smuggling. Eyewitness News reporter Zach Briggs spoke with a retired Homeland Security agent who explains the bigger picture of human trafficking in Texas. 18-year-old Julio Rivera told detectives a friend asked him about stealing a car for human smuggling adding that he was dropped off when he noticed Alana Castaneda and her Mercedes in the Whole Foods parking lot. Harry Jimenez, who served 16 years with the Department of Homeland Security, says human smuggling is traditionally not connected with violent crimes. But he stressed criminal organizations tend to target younger individuals to smuggle people across the U.S.-Mexico border. You have prices up to $100,000 to bring somebody into the U.S. illegally. So these organizations have a lot of money and they have a lot of need. He says human smuggling groups may utilize certain types of vehicles to blend in better with the region and avoid police detection. But in some instances, it can turn deadly. Unfortunately, 
in the last few months, there have been several cases of rollover vehicles uh, full of uh, illegal immigrants, uh, many who lose their lives because they overload these vehicles. What caught Jimenez's attention about the quarry incident was the Mercedes being targeted. We are looking at perhaps a human smuggling organization that already have stash houses in San Antonio. They already brought the individuals from the border, and now they need a vehicle can, that can mix better on the I-35 or the I-10 corridor. And while Jimenez isn't able to recommend what one might do in a carjacking situation, he did have this to say. The only thing that I can tell you as a retired law enforcement officer is how much value we put to our lives. A vehicle probably has insurance. Our lives would have a second chance. Zach Briggs, Ken's 5, Eyewitness News. We have new details this morning on a Chinese businesswoman who trespassed at former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago Resort this morning. We're learning that she has been deported to China after being held on immigration custody for two years. The woman was sentenced to eight months in prison after her jailing at the Glades County Detention Center was prolonged, according to our news partners at the Miami Herald. A family of 10 separated more than a decade ago. Eight children left behind after their parents were deported back to Mexico. KLBK's Brenda Lipinski got to talk to the family today. Now, Brenda, they're hoping to bring their parents back to Lubbock, right? Yes, Terry, they are. It's been 12 years since the Camargo kids have been able to see their parents, and they've contacted an attorney who is confident that they'll be able to reunite with their parents within these next few years. I can't even see them or touch them or anything. My parents weren't bad people. They were good people. Nancy, Alondra, and Patricia Camargo's parents, Cristina and David Camargo, were deported back in 2009, which left them and their five other siblings alone. The family says they were back to school shopping at the mall when a group of people separated them from their parents. We didn't know what to think. We were just very emotional because they were questioning us, wanting to know everything about us, our name, our date of birth and everything, making sure we were actually, you know, citizens. The children's godparents taking all eight children in and the kids growing up without their mom and dad. Just having friends that were able to, you know, always say mom this, mom that, dad this, dad that. We just didn't get to do that. <laughs> Throughout those 12 years, the parents missing graduations, proposals, and other major life moments. And now the family working to bring their parents back <clears throat> through a GoFundMe. I really want to be with them to help them and support them in whatever they want to do. Now the family has been coordinating bake sales, cookout sales, and has set up a GoFundMe for legal expenses. You can find that on our website, everythinglovick.com. One woman is suing the Knox County Sheriff's Office for more than $2 million. The suit centers on an ongoing agreement between Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, with the Sheriff's Office. That deal gives ICE authority to local sheriff's offices to hold people they suspect of entering the U.S. illegally. 10 News reporter Vinay Simlot explains why this case has broader impacts than this one woman. The lawsuit starts with a 911 call. According to the transcript, Myra Oviedo Granado's partner assaulted her. She said she thought he was armed. When sheriff's deputies got to the house, the lawsuit says they arrested her for assault, even though she made the 911 call. <laughs> then court documents say the Knox County Sheriff's Office held her because they suspected she came to the U.S. illegally. There's a governmental document that appears to give the authority to the Knox County Sheriff's Office to hold the individual in question. Yeah. In 2017, yeah. Knox County oh, Sheriff J.J. Hey. Jones sure. entered a 287G agreement with federal immigration officials. It trains sheriff's deputies to check a suspect's immigration status after an arrest. Okay. Attorney T. Um, Scott Jones I says it's a policy issue, not necessarily one of law. That's a debate for a different day. The lawsuit says the Knox County Sheriff's Office entered the agreement illegally. It cites a statute from 2007 that would ask the county commission to approve an agreement like this one. But the county's law director says in a memo from earlier this year, a newer law gives that authority to the sheriff. And the new is always going to supplant the old. Attorney T. Scott Jones says he thinks the lawsuit will be over quickly. I don't know that at the end of the day, that the court system 
is going to find a substantive violation of the law such that Knox County would be held liable. Caravans expected to converge into one in Mexico with the Border Patrol and the Rio Grande Valley already overwhelmed. Yeah, CBP says agents have encountered nearly 2,000 migrants in a 24-hour period on Friday. Joining us now to react, Chris Cabrera, Vice President of the National Border Patrol Council, live from San Antonio. Chris, we're talking about really big numbers here. A caravan, caravan with potentially 10,000 people, 2,000 apprehensions on Friday alone. Is there any reason for this particular surge? that's taking place right now, and how is Border Patrol handling this? Well, you know, the, the reason is, is um, we're not doing anything to stop it. You know, we, we saw these uh, these big rushes that, that came uh, earlier this year, the one that hit Del Rio, and the state of Texas stepped up and pushed back. Um, but that's not addressing any of the problems of them coming into the country. Now, it, they may not hit Del Rio, but they will hit somewhere in the United States, whether it be in Arizona or the Rio Grande Valley. Um, there's really not much that, that we've we've done to, to stop this. It, it's the administration is very soft on immigration right now. The whole world knows it, and and by offering incentives for people to cross illegally, it's going to continue to to get worse. But how much worse could it get if a 10,000 person caravan hits our southern border? That seems like a lot to me. Oh yeah, it, it is a lot, you know. And unfortunately, we we've seen numbers. Uh, like this before, but but it's starting to become uh, um, closer together. It, at first, it was you know two three thousand at a time, months apart, and and now we're seeing two thousand a day. Um, it, it's going to continue. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if if we just uh, blow past this uh, this uh, the high water mark of what two hundred and twelve thousand. Yeah. Chris, one way to end this crisis would be to lean on Mexican President Lopez Obrador and say, listen, you got to defend your uh, southern border with Guatemala so that these migrant caravans can't come through. The president is meeting with a Mexican president this week. How do you expect that conversation to go? You know, I expect that conversation to go like most. Um, it's going to be all one sided, not in favor of the United States. Um, I, I think the, the way to stop this is mandatory detention, mandatory removal. Uh, stop the incentive for people coming, and, and regardless of what other countries do, if if we put a make a hard line in the sand, it, it'll stop. Chris, let's look at some numbers. Mexico considering tougher entry requirements for Venezuelan migrants, yeah. like Carly mentioned earlier, partly in response to requests from us here in the U.S. But these numbers are are telling. 2021, over 47,000 Venezuelan apprehended at the border. Wow. Just 1,000 last year. My question for you, Chris, why did the U.S. and Mexican governments wait until it absolutely got out of hand to do something? Why wasn't this approach they're hopefully going to be taking standard operating procedure all along? Well, you know, uh, you know if you'll remember, um, this time last year we weren't having this problem. Um, it, it just happened when the new administration came in and decided they were going to uh, cut off its nose to spite its face just so they could show Trump who the boss was. Um, and, and that's what we're dealing with here. It, it has nothing to do with with actual policies that work. It, it, it's all about, you know, personal preference and, and, and spite. The Biden administration said that um, they're going to reinstate the Remain in Mexico policy in mid-November. It's now mid-November. So do you do you expect them to actually go through with that? You know, uh, honestly, I, I hope that they do, but I, I seriously doubt that they will. Um, and a lot of that has, it depends on Mexico as well. Is Mexico going to cooperate with that? Because our Supreme Court can say what they want till it blew in the face, but if it if Mexico doesn't go along with it, there's really not much we can do. Maybe that's something they can talk about when they meet later this week. Chris Cabrera, thank you for joining us. All right, thank you. You bet. The time